Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Tent of Abraham. I'm Tamir Kreisman from Israel, and this is Parashat Vatchanan, the plea. The parsha can be found in Deuteronomy uh, 3.23 to 7.11, and this one is called Pretty Please, with sugar on top. So what can I say? The name of the parsha pretty much says it all. Now, if you read it with that kind of understanding of what this plea actually was, I believe it will be much more impactful. In fact, the only reason that I'm here is for continuity's sake. Now I'm just kidding. I love this. I wish this was my full-time job, but alas, the brother's got to eat too, right? So we got the bread of the uh, bread of the spirit and the bread of the flesh. Now, if it wasn't for the Torah, I'd be a dead man. We all would be. I'd be a waste of breath and a waste of space. I have no idea what's happening right now, but I'm taking it day by day personally. And we have to question our motives uh, for coming before God, right? We always have requests of our Heavenly Father, but how do we approach Him? And this is, this is going to be a, an important lesson for us all today. We have to ask ourselves what we are asking Him, how we are asking Him. Is it for our sake or is it for His sake? Our Parsha opens up with a vulnerable and valuable life lesson from Moses. He's opening his heart over here. Now, before we get into it, I'm going to give you a wonderful story I heard a rabbi once tell. Um, again, it's very much relevant. So there was this man who came every evening and he sat to learn in a Beit Midrash. Now, for those of you who don't know, a Beit Midrash is a house of learning, okay? Like when, I, when I'm giving now, it's called a drash. Right, a drash, the midrash. So a bait midrash, bait is bite, house, house of midrash. Uh, this is where Jews get together to learn, usually in, uh, in pairs for the sake of iron sharpening iron. It's called a chavuta. Chavuta comes from the word chavel, right? Two friends sitting over there going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Now, sometimes one of the rabbis gives a drash while everyone listens, and sometimes people just go for the atmosphere and they learn by themselves. In any case, if you've ever walked into one of these places, or if you've never walked into one of these places, the best way for me to describe it is that there is electricity in the air. Now think of dozens, if not hundreds of guys who have dedicated their lives to the Word of God and to knowing God, all studying out loud with great zeal. I mean, people are screaming. I could be sitting right here, learning with my guy right here, and another person will be sitting right here, learning with his guy going back and forth, and there's hundreds of pairs going on simultaneously. Hundreds of heated debates and conversations are happening simultaneously, one right next to the other, like the sound of many waters. Kolot maim rabim. And still, everyone is laser focused on the topic at hand. I can't even hear what they're saying because I'm so into what's going on right here. It is a sight indeed. So I've had the privilege of studying in such a place years back, and with the proper guidance, it is absolutely infectious. So, to our story, there was this one guy in a Beit Midrash, and he was, you know, he liked to go in there and learn by himself. Now, this particular guy had anger issues in his own life when things either didn't turn out how he had expected or when someone else ailed him, someone pissed him off, you know. It happens. It happens to all of us, right? But this guy had this problem, like a particular problem with this. He didn't know how to handle it. So he told this to the rabbi, and the rabbi said, okay, all right, no problem. We'll deal with it. Go sit on the, the table right outside. So that's what he did. It was close to the, the rabbi's office over there. He says, grab a chumash and start learning something, right? So he did. After about five minutes, the gabai, the gabai is like the, ter the caretaker. So let's say if the rabbi is the, uh, the captain, the gabai would be the sergeant, right? The rabbi would tell the gabai what to do, and the gabai would basically make sure that everything is taken care of. So the gabai of the Beit Midrash, he bumped into the guy accidentally, and he spilled a cup of water all over his head while the guy was, you know, learning. So the guy was soaking wet from head to toe, down his face, down his beard. His shirt was wet right on his lap. Okay, but he didn't seem to get upset. That's not bad for a guy with anger issues. He continues learning. A few minutes later, from the other side, 
Another guy walked by his chair and knocked him in the head with his elbow. You ever fall asleep in an aisle seat at the airplane? And they, yeah, so kind of like that. Knocked his hat right off. He's like, ow. You know, the man apologized profusely, of course. But our guy was very forgiving and very understanding. So now he's sitting there. He's still focused on what the rabbi told him to do. He said, study Torah. Okay, that's what I'm doing, rabbi. No problem. While he's soaking wet and, you know, even possibly slightly concussed at this point. But he's okay. Don't worry about it. He's a tough guy, our boy. So just as he was seated, yet again, gaining his composure, another man who had a handful of pretzels accidentally walked right into him, bashed his knee, and the pretzels and all those crumbs ended up all over the guy's head, on his beard, on his hair, down his shirt. It was very uncomfortable. So now this dude who just wants to go sit, learn Torah, what the rabbi told him to do, is now sitting soaking wet with the lump on his head, with the bash in his knee, and now he's got pretzel crumbs all over his face and down his shirt. And yet, this guy with anger issues, he seems okay. He takes a deep breath, composes himself, and he continues learning. Shortly after this happened, the rabbi calls him into his office, and he says, tell me, son, are you sure you have anger issues? The man replied, yes, Rabbi, I, I do. The rabbi said, are you sure? Because in a span of about 15 minutes, I saw you get a big glass of water poured all, all over your head. You got your head bashed in, you got your knee clocked, and now you got pretzel crumbs all over your beard and your head, and inside my shirt, and inside your shirt. Yes, that too. Now be honest with me, son. Do you really have a problem with anger? The man replied, Rabbi, it's true. I greatly struggle with anger when people ail me and when things don't go my way. However, however, Rabbi, I was fully aware of the fact that you sent the Gabbai to pour water all over me and that most likely he sent the other two students to bump into me and to make me feel extremely uncomfortable to try and get a rise out of me. How could you possibly know that? asked the Rabbi. You see, Rabbi, I knew for a fact that you were testing me because I heard everything that you said to the Gabbai. You told him what to do, so I knew it was coming. So even though it was indeed an inconvenience and possibly disorienting at times, since I knew it was a test, dear Rabbi, I believe that you had my best interests at heart because I trust you. I knew you were testing me. The Rabbi gave the man a warm smile and said, You see, my son, if you believe that I, a simple flesh and blood man, has sent others to ail you and cause you discomfort, and yet because you believed me, those instances did not anger you. To the contrary, you dealt with them like a champ because you knew that I was testing and watching you. How much more so? Should you give heed to our Heavenly Father when trials and tribulations enter your life. God loves you so much more than I ever could. And he sees everything that's around every corner. In fact, he's the one that places us there. And the corners too, right? And therefore, my dear friends, whenever a bad person enters our life, or should we fall on what seems to be a series of unfortunate events, just remember, he did this for our sake. If we could trust another person close to us, how much more so should we trust our Heavenly Father? God tried Abraham 10 times before the final covenant. He tries us every single day, all the time. Everything is a test. How many of us have been seriously wronged by someone in our lives, right? Are we playing the hand games again? I mean, all of us, who has not? I don't know anyone that hasn't. Funny thing is the other side believes that they're in the right, but people have wronged them as well. This is a universal thing. This happens all the time. How many of us have had to deal with heartache, with heartbreak, with financial struggle, with lack of direction, with sickness, or even with death? Who did all these things? Of David, a song. The land and the fullness thereof are the Lord's. 
the world and all those who dwell therein. לדוד מזמור לאדוני הארץ אמרה תבל ויושבי בה. And if we know that, then by default, we got to believe this. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen one, and I called you by your name, I surnamed you, yet you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, although you have not known me. In order that they know from the shining of the sun and from the west, that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other, who forms light and creates darkness, who makes peace and creates evil. I am the Lord who makes all these. In other words, whether you actually see God's hand in your life or not, in both the good and the bad is completely irrelevant. He's there, and his eye and his hand are constantly upon you. You might not see it. You might not even know him, right? So that you don't know me, but still I'm going to pull you up, he says. You probably think that that schmuck who tried to ruin your life was acting on his own. That that guy who tried to destroy you financially, that that person that did this, that this person that did that, God sent them to you on purpose to test you. We're all messengers of God. Every single thing. Everything is God's. The world and everything and everyone in it. Agents of God. That's what we are. But it's up to us as to what kind of messengers we want to be. We always pray to God to make us worthy vessels, right? Send me on a shaliach mitzvah, right? So I can do good, so I can bring light into the world. We were called to clean ourselves from the inside, not just outside appearances. God doesn't care how long your beard is or how long your peyot are or how black and white you dress. God does not care about these things. That, that does not make a person. That's, that might be a reflection from, inter- from inside, but still, these aren't a parameter. No one cares about that. He uses the worthy ones to spread light while he uses the ones who still need cleaning to do the dirty work. Because even though the person was sent to do you wrong by God, the person still did wrong. You see what I'm saying? They're still going to have to pay for what they did. That's, that's how it works. Now, they don't know that they're necessarily doing the dirty work, mind you. They believe in their minds that they're in the right, like we discussed. To which we always say, you shall know a tree by its fruit and see what happens. And so regardless of what we might perceive as good or bad, good or evil, fortunate or unfortunate, it all comes from the same source. And if we know that, then let's be real, folks. The only way for us to know this is either by one of these three ways, starting with hearing, speaking, doing. One will and should ultimately lead to the others, but it's obvious that the first, you know, step is hearing. I mean, faith comes by hearing. Duh. So now that we're a little bit clear on this matter, let's take a look at Moses' interaction with God as he entreats him. Which on the surface might seem contrary to everything that we just discussed. Or is it? Chapter 3, verse 23. Vaitchanan el Adonai ba'etahi le'emo. I entreated the Lord. At that time saying, Vaitchanan, I begged, I implored, I pleaded. At that time, what time? That time was after Moses himself, being 120 years old, took out two pre-flood giants. Ogen Sichon. That was that particular time. Okay, so what's Moses pleading about? Next verse. O Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your strong hand. For who is like God in heaven or on earth, who can do as your deeds and your might? Adonai Elohim ata hechalot la'arot et avdecha et godlecha ve'et yadcha chazaka, asher mi el bashamayim uva'aretz asher yaseh kemaasecha ukegvuotecha. Does Moses ask God for anything right here? No, he doesn't. Yet when he says, I pleaded and I said, 
So what happened here? Does it not seem, though, that he has a full grasp on how things work? Yeah, it does. In other words, we can comprehend that from this, these words right here, that Moses understands everything is in God's hands. He just told God, who, it's, it's all in your hands. He gives recognition before he even comes. Okay, so we get this, sure we get it. But this is also something that we knew, or the, something that we should know, if, again, if we are students of the, of the Torah. So, we're speaking of the man Moses here. Don't forget everything that we've learned about him. So what was Moses actually doing right here? It seems like he was praising God, right? He was exalting God. He was pointing out the wonderful things that God can do and God's strength. He was giving, you know, heed to God. For who is like God in heaven or on earth who can do your deeds and your might? Respect. That's high praise. You see, the request comes in the next verse. Next one. So why is it so important right here what's going on? Because Moses knew his relationship with God was like father and son. And so as children, well, we want something from our father, like uh, car keys or some pocket change or any kind of favor. Remember when you were a kid or a teenager or something? Now, how do we approach him? Do we come to him like this? Hey, dad. That, that's not how we came to him, right? Because his answer would always be like, oh God, what'd you do now? Right? If we came to him like that. But if we approached him all smiling and like, you know, hey, dad, batting our eyes, we don't even have to, you know, give him a compliment. I love your haircut. You're the best dad ever. He would just kind of giggle, smile at us and be like, okay, what do you want? You know, this is how it is. It's, a, it's an innocent and pure relationship between father and son. So what does Moses do? How does he approach God? God's our father and he loves us. Moses knew this. And this is how he came to him. Just like a child would approach their father in heaven. For who is like God in heaven or on earth? And what father would give their child a stone when they ask for bread? Pray let me cross over and see the good land that is on the other side of the Jordan. This good mountain and the Lebanon. Now, here's the request. Now, I just want you to know, now later on in the book of Deuteronomy, I will go much deeper into this exchange because this is epic. So for now, I'm just going to tell you this. Moses did much more than just Plea and uh, plead and beg right here. In fact, he almost ended the world. Trust me, it's a good story, but at a later point in time. But for now, what's he saying right here? Well, for starters, he's speaking in layers. Just as God did. God speaks in layers. Moses speaks in layers because Moses and God are one. So Moses on his own, even if God is not speaking through him, he knows how to communicate because they're one and the same. And not a single word or letter that Moses spoke was wasted. That was the kind of level that he was on. So I'm going to give you several viewpoints of what's actually happening here right now in this verse. The Malbim said, He asked God to please enter as a layman and not as the leader of Israel. Let me go in as one of the people. Fine, Joshua will lead. I'll just, just enter into the land. Why? Only, only so that he see the good land. And here Moshe did not want to come into the land to eat the fruit, but rather only because the land is ready for a higher holiness. And there will rise more in the, uh, in the entirety and also keep the commandments that dependent upon the land, as it is written in the verse, and see the good land. Now I want you to just think about this logically for, for a minute. Most of God's commands in the Torah can only be fulfilled in the land of Israel, the land which was promised. This is what God was telling Bnei Israel for the duration of the 40 years, so that you will enter into the land, that you will enter into the land. So, if we look at the things from the end, back to the beginning, we have the end of days, the coming of Messiah, the building of the third temple, right? That all happens in the end. Now, this can only be achieved when Israel are in the land, fulfilling God's commands of the Torah. In other words, it all starts 
with the mitzvot. That's how you, that's how you get to that process. So if you dismiss the commands, the mitzvot, the Torah, what comes next has nothing to do with you. Or rather, you have nothing to do with it. Just something to think about. So let's continue. To the best of the soul's perfection, which is the true good. And so if Moses had entered into the land, he would have immediately learned the location of Mount Moriah, which was hidden until the days of David. And the temple would have been built immediately by Moses as he had, uh, as he had seen this good mountain and the Lebanon. Now, some of you may not know this, but only the patriarchs have been to the location of Mount Moriah, that very, very specific mount, the, very, the Temple Mount, the Holy of Holies, right there, only the patriarchs. But they didn't know the way. God showed them when they were there. First, it was Abraham and Isaac together. Now, we can see this in Genesis 22. And, there, uh, and before God shows him where it is, it began with a test, Genesis 22. And it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham, just like he tests us. And he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, please take your son, your only one, whom you love, Isaac, and go away to the land of Moriah. He didn't say the mountain of. He said the land. It's, it was a region, okay? And, and it was a, a barren region at that point. And bring him up there for a burnt offering in one, one of the mountains of which I will tell you. In other words, I'll let you know. That's how he spoke to Abraham. Lech lecha, go to the place that I'll tell you. Just start walking in that general direction. I'll tell you when to stop. God doesn't tell you every single detail of your life. But you know, now we know, we always know what direction to head in. If we veer off path, you should know that ain't the way. God will let you know. He'll tell you when to stop. So again, the land of Moriah was just a region. And bring him up there on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Now, Abraham went there with his two servants. There was Ishmael, his son, and Eliezer. Okay? But they couldn't see the mountain with smoke rising from it to the heavens. Only Abraham and Isaac could see it. You see, it wasn't time yet. So Abraham built an altar. And we know the rest of the story. Now, let's see what about Jacob. We can find Jacob's story in Genesis 28, 11. And he arrived at the place and lodged there because the sun had set. And he took some of the stones of the place, of the place, and placed them at his head, and he lay down in that place. Now, the Hebrew here is completely different. He arrived at the place. The Hebrew says, Vaifga bamakom. Vaifga bamakom literally means hit the spot. Vaifga, boom, bamakom, the spot. Jacob hit the spot. And what was this spot? The spot was of the altar, that which Abraham bound Isaac, and the eternal covenant was made. Because the sun had set, supernaturally maybe, because God commanded the sun to set at that very moment, midday, for the sake of Jacob. Now watch this. I know we're getting a bit off topic here, and I'll discuss this in detail when we get to Genesis, but I gotta show you this. And he took some of the stones of the place and placed them at his head. Jacob's ladder, and so on and so forth. That's what happened. Then in verse 17, when he woke up, and he was frightened, and he said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. A hint, maybe? And then in the very, very next verse, 18, And Jacob arose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had placed at his head, and he set it upon as a monument, and he poured oil on top of it. Now, remember before how he took some of the stones, it says, and he took some of the stones and placed it over his head. And now what happens? And he took the stone, there's one stone. Without getting into too much crazy detail so we can move on, where did he take these stones from when there were many stones? From the altar which Abraham built. And how many stones did Jacob place under his head? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Twelve. Right. This is before he even produced 
his 12 children or 13 children, but the 12 tribes. And when he woke after his encounter, the 12 became one, Jacob at the head. And this place was called the house of God. So the patriarchs might have been there, but they didn't know where they were going. They were just shown. And even it says in Deuteronomy 12, verses 5 and 6, but only to the place which the Lord your God shall choose for all your tribes to set his name there, you shall inquire after his dwelling and come there. God still did not tell them. And there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and the separation by your hand and your vows and your donations and the firstborn of your cattle and your sheep. In other words, he's talking about Beit HaMikdash, the temple. And God hasn't told them there yet. So where was the first time that we see God telling anyone where his chosen place was? And this can be found in 2 Samuel 24, beginning at verse 12. Now, at this point, the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel were a mess. David was king in Israel right now. Um, verse 12, go and speak to David. So says the Lord. This is God telling uh, Gad, the prophet Gad, Gad the seer, to go speak to David. So says the Lord. Three things I offer you. Choose for yourself one of them, and I shall do it to you. David sinned. God let him choose his punishment. Hard choice. And Gad came to David. And he told him, and he said to him, do you prefer that seven years of famine in your land shall come upon you or three months that you shall flee before your oppressor while he pursues you or that there be three days pestilence in your land? Now know and consider what I shall reply to him that sent me. And David said to Gad, not God, Gad, I am greatly oppressed. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. But into the hand of man, let me not fall. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning until the appointed time, three days. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men. And the angel, Vaishlach Yado Hamalach, and the angel stretched out his hand towards Jerusalem to destroy it, to destroy Jerusalem. And the Lord regretted the evil. And he said to the angel that destroyed among the people, it is enough. Now stay your hand right there. It's coming down. Oh, his, the hand of the angel of the Lord was over Jerusalem. And that's where it stopped. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arvana, the Jebusite. Aravna, the Jebusite. So David sees all this happening, including the angel of the Lord, which no man could see because it's a spirit being. The angel was halted in Jerusalem, standing exactly at the threshing floor of Aravna the Jebusite. So he knew, wait a minute, wait a minute, what's going on right here? And David said to the Lord, when he saw the angel that smote among the people, and he said, behold, I have sinned and I have acted uh, iniquitously, but these she, I can't read this word, excuse me, iniquity, iniquitously, iniquitously, but these sheep, what have they done? I beg that your hand be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came to David that day and said to him, go up to erect an altar to the Lord in the threshing floor of Aravna, the Jebusite. Here we go. So right over there is where David erected the altar that would become the first temple of God. This is where God is saying, here's the spot. There it is. As we know, David could not build the temple. And that's why Solomon, son of David, another candidate for Messiah, obviously, would build it. Again, it says during uh, Solomon's day was the closest time to the end of the age. Never been a, a day of peace like that ever. So what is the purpose of Messiah, son of David, in the end of days? Just in case we all missed it, it is to unite Israel. That's what David did. He united Israel. We are not dividers, but unificators. His whole point is to unite Israel, build the third temple, and to bring literal and physical peace and prosperity to the world. Has this happened? No. Therefore, Messiah, son of David, not here. Messiah, son of Yosef's job, 
the Messiah, son of Joseph. His job is to awaken the sparks that are the souls of Israel and begin a tshuva process, a process of, uh, of repentance and redemption of all the lost souls of Israel that are scattered throughout uh, the nations. While the son of David is to establish them in the physical sense, okay? It starts with the spirit and then it ends with the physical, i.e. kingdom of heaven on earth. That's the process. We are currently in it. Okay, so this was a long detour and we did take somewhat of a scenic route, but it was a nice, uh, it was a nice view. So we learned a lot about what had happened, what's happening and what will happen. Right? We just got the past, the present, and the future. And why did we learn all this? Because this is exactly what Moses was looking at when the Lord showed him the good mountain and the Lebanon. Now Moses saw the three temples, and he understood the necessity of their destruction, as well as the four exiles that the children of Israel would go through once they enter into the land. So what is the good mountain? The good mountain is Jerusalem. And what is the Lebanon in this context? The Lebanon is the temple of God. Now, again, because there is obviously the country of Lebanon, but that's far north and that's the region of Lebanon. The Lebanon, I'll explain in a second why it's called that. So those of you who have been to Israel and have seen Jerusalem from the inside and the outside of the old city, um, Jerusalem is a city on a hill, not a mountain. It's a hill. It's called a mountain, but that's only because it's a lot bigger than what it might seem. So it's kind of a, it's, it's a hill. Okay, we'll call it a hill in a valley surrounded by higher mountains around it. So think of if you're looking at like a bathtub and Jerusalem is a small hill within a bathtub over there. That's what it is. So, which means that aside from the distance of where Moses was standing, there was no way at all that Moses could have seen Jerusalem with his own eyes, okay? Maybe if, if Jerusalem was a huge, huge mountain, he might have been able to see it from where he was, next to Jericho. But it's, it was in a dip. It would be impossible. And second, what does the Lebanon have to do with this, right? Lebanon was and still is a northern region. Now, if you know your geography, Lebanon is to the north of Israel. They're um, a hostile environment. And that's even farther away from where Moses was standing. So why, why oh why, is what he saw called the Lebanon. And what does it have to do with the good mountain? Lebanon comes from the word Lavan. And that can be found in Isaiah 1 verses 18. Come now, let us debate, says the Lord. If your sins prove to be like crimson, they will become white as snow. If they prove to be as red as, cr as crimson dye, they shall become as wool. Lavan kashelig, katsemir. The lavan, the whitening, is, uh, is the tshuva process, is the redemption, is the healing, is the purity. That is what Moses saw in the temple of God. You see, the temple was the only chance the children of Israel had for redemption, since it was the only place, once it was known to David, that all of Israel would bring the korbanot, the sacrifices. So, rendering our sins like crimson to be white as snow, pure and holy. Now, when the third temple is to be built, that will obviously be our final redemption, and there will be no more evil in this world. The evil inclination, there will be no more sin in this world. Poof, gone, just like that. So the Lebanon, in this context, is are the temple temples of God. This is what God showed Moses. This is what he saw. But now you have to ask yourself again, why did God have to show him this? Right? You remember our story from the beginning? What, Moses didn't trust God? Of course he trusted God. He says you can't go in. What's the deal here? Did Moses not have faith or trust in God when he said, I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but you can't enter into the land? Should that not have been enough for Moses? The thing is, it was enough. It was more than enough. No man alive knew God more intimately than Moses. These are God's words, which is why Moses kept pressing. You see, because if you know God, then you know how he operates. That's the thing. So again, if we read verse 24, listen up. Here's a hint. I hope you get this. 
O Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your strong hand. O Lord, who has begun a good work in me, will he not be faithful to complete it? Yes, he will. You see what I'm saying? Moses saw the completion of his work over there. He saw it was across the Jordan. The same work that God began in him. He saw the completion of his mission right there. And by the way, this is what the Vilna Gaon says about this. Those are his words. Because in Jewish thought, this is how God works. And now you know where that concept comes from. For he who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. These words did not originate in the New Testament. You see, if Moses would have entered into the land of Israel, he would have beelined it directly to the good mountain, and he would have brought down the third temple and the final redemption. This is what he would have done, skipping over the first two. There would be no destructions. There would be no exiles. And if that were the case, do you know what kind of implications that would have for the rest of the world? I'll tell you. The rest of the world would have been destroyed. It would have only been the children of Israel in the land. Nations? Gone. Moses did not understand why he was not allowed to do this. And that's why God had to show him. But it gets better. Moses knew Torah so well. Again, he was, he was the living Torah. That he invoked God based on his own words. And what are words but a description of a personality? The Torah is God and God is the Torah. They are one. That's why when we live the Torah, we become one with God. So what does he say? Verse 26, But the Lord was angry with me because of you, and he did not listen to me. And the Lord said to me, It is enough for you. Speak to me no more regarding this matter. Enough. Do not speak another word in this matter. For your sake? Where is this coming from? The whole reason he wanted to come into the land of Israel is to bring the final redemption to the people of God, to the people that he shepherded for 40 years. How could God be angry at him for his desire to complete the work that God himself bestowed upon him? God quite literally had to tell Moses, Rav Lecha, stop it, shut your mouth, no more. Don't say another word. Why did he say this? Does God not always answer the prayers of the righteous as God says? Especially when the prayer is in regards to the fulfillment of his word and the salvation of his people. Ah, here's one of Moses' prayers brought to us from Midrash Tanchuma. And this, this is simply from the word Vayet Hanan, the name of our Parsha. Moses said, Master of the universe, Ribono Shalolam, you have written your Torah in regards to a Hebrew slave in Exodus 21.5. He says, hey, here's your, this is your word says. What does Exodus 21.5 say? But if the slave says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go free. If that is the case, then you said that his master, verse 6, his master shall bring him to the judges, and he shall bring him to the door of the doorpost, and his master shall, uh, shall bore his ear with an, uh, with an owl, and he shall serve him forever. In other words, a slave that does not want to go free says, I love my master, I love my wife, I love my children, because my master gave me my wife, and my wife gave me my children, my son. I, I don't want to go free. Okay, now, and there's a process for this, and there he's going to serve him forever. So Moses is saying, I am proclaiming that I love my master, God. He is my creator who molded me. I am proclaiming that I love my wife, the Torah, 
who was given to me by God, and I am proclaiming that I love my son, the children of Israel. I will not go free. I don't want to die. I want to live forever and serve you forever. This is what Moses is pleading. And how did God answer Moses? Stop it. Shut your mouth. No more. Say what? How could you deny this request, Lord? This is kind of crazy. He's asking for all the right reasons in the purest of heart. He's pleading. He didn't want just asking. So you want an answer? I give you an answer. During the lesson of the slave who is set free, we can understand that the request must be heard if it's presented two times. Now this is from Masechet Kiddushin 2a. How many times does Moses ask God? It says it right here in the beginning of the verse. Evra na. Na is please. Okay? That's one time. Which means if there was one more na in there, God would have answered his prayer. Now where do we see this? This isn't some made up thing. We could see it in the book of Numbers 12, 13. In the case of Miriam's leprosy. Moses cried out to the Lord saying, I beseech you, God, please heal her. Let's read the Hebrew. Vaitzak Moshe el Adonai lemor el na refa na la. Boom. What happened? Immediately she was cleansed of her leprosy. Meaning that if he would have asked na a second time, Moses would have entered into the land, built the temple, the final redemption would come. But the children of Israel would have been destroyed as well. Yeah. Because at that time, only Moses was worthy to receive God's kingdom on earth. Only Moses. Is there anyone out there right now who believes that they're on the level of Moses? Do you? I certainly would not be foolish or prideful enough to say that. Not even Joshua, okay? And here lies our lesson. Once Moses was made aware of all of this by God, he immediately ceased his plea. Moses was equal to all of Israel. Every last man, woman, and child of Israel, Moses was in the balance with them. And he had a choice. Moses was given a choice. As he did throughout the entire time that he was in the desert with them. When God told him, I will rid myself of them and begin a new line with you, to which Moses replied, if you cast them out, there was one please take me out of your book blot my name out how many times did he put his life before theirs Moses gave his life so Israel could live this quite literally happened right now and if Israel lives the world has a chance that's why we see so many significant matters in this portion if you read this portion, it's jam-packed, but I'm giving you the eyes right now. In chapter 4, we have Moses warning Israel of the importance of being obedient. The reminder about what happened on Mount Sinai. And another warning against idolatry. We have the cities of refuge and a preface to the Ten Commandments, which is an entire subject matter on its own as we can see in chapter 4, verses 44. And this is the instruction which Moses set before the children of Israel. This is what we say every time we read the Torah. And we lift up the Torah, either before or after, depending if you're Ashkenaz or Sfard. We lift up the Torah scroll, and with our pinky we say, why our pinky? Because it might seem small, but a little bit of Torah could go a whole long way. So, we don't need to be like, Ugh. all you need is this and the Word of God, you're good. You could conquer anything, right? So this sequence of words can be read throughout the book of Leviticus. And they have meaning and power. But wait, there's more. Chapter 5, we got the Ten Commandments. We have the Ten Commandments. Another reminder not to worship engraved images. And another warning against idolatry. I guess it must be a thing, huh? Chapter 6. The Shema prayer. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. The actual prayer that we say twice a day. 
and yet another reminder against disobedience. He starts it with disobedience, he ends it with dis disobedience. And once he ends it with disobedience, then chapter 7 speaks of the holiness of the nation of Israel. None of these topics and these subject matters are relevant if you don't understand Moses' thought process and his relationship with God. You could be reading this and be like, okay, 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 it's so repetitive. There's a reason that this is happening like this. Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, he is our teacher, he is our rabbi. We're supposed to learn from him. So let's do that. So when we begin the first words in chapter 4, after Moses finishes explaining his discussion with God, we see, And now, O Israel, pretty please, with sugar on top, hearken to the statutes and to the judgments which I teach you to do in order that you may live uh, and, go, and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your forefathers is giving you. Vata Yisrael Shmai la Chukim Vela Mishpatim Asha Nochim Al Medatchem la Asot Lema Antichyu Uvatem Verishtem at Aretz Asher Donai Lohe Votechem Noten Lachem. What are the statutes and the judgments? We discussed this. These are commands which make sense and commands which don't make sense. Oh, okay, here's a logical explanation for it, therefore I'm doing it. And those, I have no understand why I said don't mix wool and linen, yet the same God that gave me this is the same God that gave me that. So if I proclaim to not understand that, I'm ignoring the God that says this. Do you understand? This is what he's doing. And to which do you believe is a greater level of, of ascension? Which you think carries more weight, that which you understand or that which you do not understand? Obedience. I've had many conversations with many of you, and I'm still sometimes surprised in regards to your agreement on how things are done or how things are not done in the Jewish world. Yeah, I don't understand that, therefore I don't hold by it. Yeah, that makes no sense to me. I'm not gonna, nah. Now, look. I don't do everything. I really don't do everything, okay? I openly admit this. If you ask me, I'll tell it to your face. I do not follow all the commands. It's not because I don't understand. It's because I'm going through my own process. I'm still trying to do as much as I can, and I constantly take it upon myself to always add and always do more than I've done, right? Whether it sits well with me or whether it doesn't, but I know the God who told me to do these things, and I know that it's for my benefit. But I would never, ever dare and say, because it's something that doesn't make sense to me, therefore I don't agree with it, therefore I'm not doing it. What Am I saying that God doesn't... I, come on. Who are we really disagreeing with after all? You're not disagreeing with the rabbis, you're disagreeing with God. That's why God gives us the vegetables with the dessert together. You get it, you don't get it, but eat it. All of it. The blessings and the curse, the good, the bad, the statutes and the judgments. And oh yeah, in order that you may live. Because if you don't accept this, all of this, you will surely die. Do not add to the word which I command you, nor diminish from it to observe the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. לא תוסיפו על הדבר אשר אנוכי מצווה אתכם, ולא תגרו ממנה. Now, many Christians and many Messianics out there have thrown this verse around in regards to the oral law. Oh, the oral law. Look, God clearly states in here that you shouldn't add and look at what the rabbis are doing. And so many Christians and Messianics, what are you going to do? They don't understand the, the words that they be reading. That's it. You see... God knew that this would be a problem, because it is. Therefore, I know that he knew, because we see it. And that's why the answer comes in the very next verse. That's why we never take things out of context, because that's just foolishness. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did to Baal Peor. Read this with me. Verse 3. For every man who went after Baal Peor, the Lord your God has exterminated from your midst. What does Baal have to do 
or not do with adding or taking away from the Torah. This is the reasoning that Moses is giving right now. He's saying, don't add or take away. You want to know the answer to this? Moses just answered that question in the next verse. Look at what the Word of God says exactly, exactly what it says. For every man who went after Baal Peor, the Lord your God has exterminated from your midst. Many went, yeah, and threw their own excrement upon the altars of Baal in order to disrespect it, okay? But is that what the Word of God says? God said, any man who went after it. That means whether you worship Baal or took dumps on their idols. This is what the Word is saying. The fact that every man who actually gave heed or paid any kind of attention to Baal was punished. God said, destroy their altars. Don't poop on them. Now, did he? So why are you going and doing things based on your own extremely limited understanding? It wasn't enough that God mentioned over and over and over the statutes and the judgments, what you understand and what you don't understand. So why are you then adding? Why are you taking away? Leviticus 8.30 is written, and you shall observe my charge, ushmaltem et mishmaltai, not to commit any of the abominable practices that were done before you, and you shall not become defiled by them. I am the Lord your God, ushmaltem et mishmaltai, and you will guard my charges. It's a double meaning over here. Again, it's it's kind of hard to translate this, but the Hebrew says guarding twice. Do we need to guard that which guards us, i.e. the Torah? The Torah is there to guard us, yet we are called to guard the Torah. Interesting. Yeah, we are called to guard the Torah. And this is why we are called la sot siag la Torah, to build a fence or a reservation around the Torah. Not for the sake of changing or adding the word of God, heaven forbid, it's written right there in black and white. Don't add or take away. It's written right there, right here in black and white. Any idiot can read it and understand, oh, don't add or take away from the Torah. Fantastic. Okay, so do you really think for one minute that our sages who dedicated their lives to Torah are that dumb that they either ignored or missed that? And all of a sudden, messianics be like, oh, look! Thanks, homie. Wow, we never saw that before. You must, Holy Spirit must be working overtime with you. The fence is for your own sake, man. Did God not just say, follow his words and you shall live? These are his, I'm taking all of these from the five books of Moses. Could you imagine if Adam would have built a 10 foot wall around the tree of knowledge with a big neon sign saying, do not eat? He didn't need to go as far as dig a moat filled with sharks with frickin' laser beams on their frickin' heads. It would not be necessary. With all the warning and the sign, that was enough. You have the Torah. You know the word. What happens if you forget? What happens if you fall? Death. Build that wall. Build that wall. Build the wall. We're looking at the oral law right here within the written law. Do you understand? We're looking at the oral law within the written law. What, you think the oral law was invented by those crazy evil rabbis less than 2,000 years ago? Good Lord. It was given to Moses so that we could live. Do you want to live? Good. Come with me if you want to live. Uh, you know, when Alexander the Great came to Israel, he had many recorded conversations with the sages back then. Now we're talking about 320 BC. He actually asked them these following questions. Check this out. He asked, how does one live? To which our sages replied, die to self. He then asked, how does one die? Our sages replied, live for self. Meaning that when we completely give up our own fleshly desires and our own understanding, 
We by default trust God completely through everything he says and everything that he does not say. And in order to die, well, we simply do whatever the hell we want. And that, my dear friends, is no way to live. So, pretty please, with sugar on top, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will correct your paths. Thank you so much for joining me as always. Have a wonderful rest of the week and a Shabbat Shalom.